I'm going to preach uh, two messages on this. I think if you live in America, uh, this last uh, three weeks, and you're a Christian, and your heart is not broken, you have a heart of ice. Uh, I'm going to be sharing from four major passages, and, and my topic is actually dealing with sharing the gospel without racism, prejudice, and discrimination. Sharing the gospel without racism, prejudice, and discrimination. I think they have my uh, outline for you. But I'm going to be looking at four passages, Galatians chapter 3, verses 22 through 29, John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, and Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. Many of you probably already know these passages by heart. You have them memorized. Um, one of the books that I was well introduced to by my Greek professor in college, Dr. Don Carson, was Galatians, the book of Galatians. So I nearly have all of Galatians memorized in Greek because that was the kind of teacher Dr. Carson was. Um, in this particular message, as I uh, told you, I have to divide it into two and preach two messages so I don't hold you here for five hours. So today I'm going to preach for two and a half hours. <laughs> uh, it is important to reflect on what the Bible says about sharing the gospel without racial considerations. And when I mean racial consideration, I have to make something clear. The word race is actually different from the word ethne. There are two words that are used in the Bible. The Bible never distinguishes anybody as being from different races. We are all from one race. The Bible does talk about ethne. Ethnic, where we get the word ethnicity from. We come from different regions, different ethnics, and different, we speak different languages, and we look different. But we all come from one race. It doesn't matter, matter whether you believe in the creation story or you believe in I was going to say a revolution. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't matter whether you are looking at it from the scientific point of view or you're looking at it from the religious point of view. Whether it be Bible story or whether it be evolution. It doesn't matter where you look at it. If you're looking at it from evolution, you're from the same monkey. Okay, <laughs> And if you're looking at it from the Bible, you're from Adam and Eve. It's also important for us as a church, as we look at this topic, and we're going to get to the Bible passage. As we look at this topic, it's very important for us to listen to what God has to say about evangelism without borders. When you go out to evangelize, you should not be looking for people who look like you. 
You should be looking for people who are without Christ. And it doesn't matter what the look is like. Racism is alive. And it is well. And I'm going to limit myself to America. Racism is everywhere. And now sometimes you may not define it as racism when you get to a country like Africa where the majority of the people are black. But you're still dealing with the same idea. Racism is somebody thinking and believing they're better than somebody else. Because of the way they look or because of the way they talk. Prejudice is alive and well in America. Discrimination is alive and well in America. Even though America is a melting pot, but the American experience was born out of racism and discrimination. If you know your history, you will say amen to that because... You will, you will agree. I'm not, I'm not trying to make something up. The only natives here are the native Indians. They're the only ones who own America. Now you are a citizen because you're born here in this land. You are a citizen either because you're born here or you change your citizenship by being a citizen through immigration. The only people who did not migrate here were the natives. And I'm always very interested sometimes when people say, go home. Amen. The only pe people that can say go home are the Indians. Amen. Because the American experience started by stealing the land from Native Americans. It's a historical fact. And the American experience also was made so bad because of the slave trade. It's really interesting that even when you're talking about Baptist history, you have to talk about slavery. And the British have been so guilty of this all of their lives. So what makes racism really bad in America is a result of the slave trade. And after the slave trade, after the English people settled here, and held colonies, they also brought with them discriminational laws that made people who look different than they are half a people. You can never forget that history of America. If you do, you're doomed to re repeat it. It's really interesting when I look at the American Christianity. A unique issue in American Christianity is, is what I call racialization of the American church. It 
It is mainly in America that you have a strong divide in the church of Jesus Christ. We have a better history here at our church. Number one, you have someone who is your pastor who was not born in this country. And you look in our congregation and you see that it's not all black and it's not all white. We are beginning to write a story to share with churches in this area and everywhere that this is what it's going to look like in heaven. And if you can't deal with it, go to hell. There's no such thing in the Bible as a black church. Look through the Bible, you will not see a black church. There were black people in the New Testament. There's no such thing as a white church. In the Old Testament, there was a time when oh, uh, the... Gentiles could not come in, but when Jesus came, Jesus became the test case. And history became his story. He changed the whole thing by saying there is neither Jew nor Greek. I may be able to just share a few things with you today, but I'm going to do an exegesis of the passages. So don't, don't be concerned. There's no black church. There's no white church. There's no Hispanic church. There's no Chinese church. There's no Asian church. There's only the church of Jesus Christ. A few years ago, when I came to this country, I came from Canada, where I had pastored a church in Canada, except for a handful of native Canadians in my church. And we didn't have a single Native American in my church. Fraser Cannon Baptist Church did not have one single Native American, I am mean a Native Canadian in the church, and there were so many Native Canadians all around them. By the time I left, the church was mixed. Of course, I was still the only black. After a while, they kept calling me the Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> They've never heard anybody preach with passion before. Amen. And when I became pastor, and I learned that they were very close to the reservations, I said, why is it that we don't have Native Canadians in our church? You won't believe what they told me. He said they're drunk most of the time. I said, well, let me find out myself. And I started developing relationship with the Native Americans, and I found out that they were not drunk all the time. I found out they love fishing. They love playing. No one has given them the gospel. After I started sharing the gospel with them, they love the gospel. Right. Amen. And they started coming to church. So, 
I graduated and I had to go to seminary and I came to California. The great state of California. And at the seminary, you, you have to have a roommate unless you're very, very rich. So my roommate was from Texas. From Douglasville, Texas. Very close to Texarkana. And when I came to Golden Gate, because I drove all the way down, I was late for the only class that I registered for, and I had nothing else to do for almost a month. Maybe a little bit more than a month. And he asked me, will you go home to Texas with me? And uh, not knowing anything, and having nothing else to do, I said, yeah. <laughs> You're trying to reveal my age there. I just turned 61, so. Uh, but, but this was 1977. Amen. 1977. And I drove with my roommate to Douglasville, Texas. It reminded me of Nigeria, how hard it was. And I was having a good time. Uh, after a while, I, I noticed that not the mom, but the father was acting like he didn't want me in the house. <laughs> So I asked my roommate, I said, uh, did you tell your parents that I was coming with you? He said, yeah. I said, your dad kind of looking at me like he doesn't want me here. I said, oh, don't worry, he's a grouch. <laughs> well, Sunday came. And it was time to go to church. But I noticed that. Saturday night, my roommate was on the phone for a long time. And then after he got off the phone, he came to my room that they gave me, and he said, uh, we're going to go to church tomorrow. Please make sure you wear your African attire. I said, am I going to be saying something? He said, no, just so they know you're a missionary. You know. <laughs> I said, okay, okay, no problem. Of course, you know, I like wearing my native attire. But I have suspicion when people tell me to wear it. We drove up to the first Southern Baptist Church of Douglasville, Texas. I, I'm going to a place here. And I was met by two deacons of the church. They met me by the before we even got to the uh, church, before I could enter, they said, nigger, where are you going? Whoa. It's kind of unfortunate because I didn't know they were talking to me. And I had to ask my roommate, I said, are they, are they talking to me? <laughs> Why 
while I was talking to my roommate, here comes the pastor. Interestingly enough, the pastor and my roommate went to the same college. So they knew each other. And he came out. And he said, uh, Tom, my roommate's name was Tom. He said, I don't know if you met Tom or not, but if you meet him, you'll never forget him. <laughs> he said, uh, I'm sorry, I thought it was okay, but the deacon said no, that, that, yeah, that I cannot come in. And uh, so I said, uh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> I said, now, this is all about me? He said, yeah, they said uh, they've never allowed a black person to come into the church, and I cannot come in. I said, well, you came to my country. You built churches in my country. We treated you like kings and queens. You won't even allow me to go into the church? He said, I'm sorry, they're babes. Uh, I said, why you make them deacons? And my roommate said, okay, let's go. We have to go to the big city to go to church. This was in 1848. Now. This was 1977. Southern Baptists came to Nigeria before 1845. Because they had to come back home in 1845 when actually what we call the pain of Baptist separation happened. When the North became American Baptist and the South held on to the name Southern Baptist. And do you know what the fight was all about? Slavery. Slavery. The, North, the Northern Baptist said, you cannot own a slave and we still appoint you as a missionary to Africa. You are your children. And the South said, forget you. And in 1845, the two Baptists separated. Of course, we are now in the Southern Baptists. And they just apologized a few years ago for over 200 years of racism. I would like to read Genesis chapter 1, and I will get to my first point. And my first point is there is only one race. The human race created by God. Genesis chapter 1. Amen. How much time do I have? I have about 10 minutes. Okay. Genesis chapter 1. And all you Bible scholars, follow me very carefully. Genesis chapter 1. And you know it's important because it's in the first book of the Bible and the first chapter. Let's read verses 26 through 28. And I'm reading mine from the King James translation. You probably say he's lost his mind. <laughs> <laughs> And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, created he him, 
male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That's the word of God. And not only is it in the Old Testament, but if you turn to the New Testament, the uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17 and verse 26. Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. Are you still with me? Okay. And he said, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and I determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. In other words, it's saying, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. That's what the word of God said. So we are one race according to the Bible. We all came from Adam and Eve. Doesn't matter whether you're black, yellow, brown, blue, whatever color you are. Your color does not add to your humanity. God delights in variety. Have you ever thought why God didn't just make it all men? And it's very clear because if you look in the Bible, he was very clear. He said, he created man and he said, male and female created he them. I'm not going to deal with another subject. Let me just stay on this. <laughs> We may have many nations and many ethnicities because God had determined where people were supposed to live from time and eternity. But he made only one race. The human race. Unless you don't believe in the story of the creation, you have no other alternative. We may be scattered all over the face of the earth, different countries bearing different skin colors, different shapes and forms, speaking different languages, but we are all the creation of God. Amen. Amen. Brother Oren is tall and handsome. And I'm short and handsome. <laughs> God delights in variety. <laughs> we all have one parent. We don't, we are all created by God, we are equally created by God, we may have different gifts, but we are all equally created by God. Yeah. 
It does not matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter in what part of the world you live in. We are created in the image of God. No one is less created in the image of God than the other. And when you put somebody down, you're putting down the image of God. That's not the only thing. My second point is that there's only one gospel. There's only one gospel. The gospel of Jesus the Christ. You don't have to create a gospel for white people. You don't have to create a gospel. You know, this is, this is the way you reach black folks. This is the way you reach Hispanic. That's ridiculous. And I'm getting hurt. <laughs> There's only one gospel. The message of the gospel is one. There's only one message. Thank you. You're going to cut all that off. Cut, it, cut that off. The message cannot be changed because of the people you're talking to because of their race. What is the gospel? The gospel is not defined by language. The gospel is not defined by race. The gospel is not defined by class. It's not defined by ethnicity. It's not divine, defined by your economic standard. The gospel is the same in America, in Canada, in Australia, in Africa, South America, Europe, anywhere in the world. The gospel does not change. And it's very easy. It's summed up in John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't say for God so loved Germany. He didn't say, for God so loved Canada or Australia or Africa. He said, for God so loved the world. The gospel has the power to save. Let me read for you real quickly. There's some of the gospel. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to close. God's, uh, First Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to follow me. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 1 through 4. And it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. That's what we preach. The crucified Christ, the buried Christ, and the resurrected Christ. He is the one that brings victory into your life. Christ has power to save in any language. Do you believe that? 
Christ has the power to save in any culture. Christ has the power to save in any ethnicity. I was saved by the gospel in Yoruba language. I was saved in Lagos, Nigeria in 1971. In Yoruba language, I was saved by a Yoruba preacher. I accepted Christ and I have shared the same gospel with people in Canada. And I shared it in the Canadian English. And Canadians came to Christ. I have shared the same gospel in Texas, in Colorado, in Alaska, in the Republic of Benin. I did not change the content of the gospel. The gospel is one. Paul stated this in Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. The true gospel is about Christ. The true gospel is about grace alone. The true gospel is color blind. The true gospel is culturally blind. The true gospel is linguistically blind. Or deaf, I should say. The true gospel is to the world. And if we are going to share it, it is time for American churches to stop defining themselves by their color. And the gospel is not wealth and health. And the gospel is not emotionalism. I'm sorry, I may be emotional today. But the gospel is not emotional. The gospel is not philosophical. The gospel is the power of salvation. Yes, Amen. Do you believe that? Yes, I tell you, before Obama ever spoke about hope, the gospel spoke about hope. The real hope. That cannot be taken from you by any government. The real hope. That cannot be taken away from you by sickness. The real hope. That cannot be taken from you. That's the gospel. Before Socrates started asking the question why. God already answered the question. Paul said, for God demonstrated his love toward us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. And let me close by saying, there's not only one race, there's not only one gospel, but there's only one church. There's only one church. You, you read Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through uh, 19. Just because I don't have time, let me paraphrase it for you. Jesus on the island of Caesarea Philippi met his disciples and he started teaching them. And he told them, he said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He didn't say, I will build my churches. He said, I will build my church. The church of Jesus Christ is one church. We may meet here at Village Baptist Church. The Presbyterian may meet at St. Andrew. Gospel Fellowship may meet in, in, in Richmond. And there, there may be a church in Africa. Maybe a church in Japan. There may be a church in Australia. But we are still one church. And the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. There's only one Lord. There's only one hope. There's only one baptism. There's only one faith. If you see Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. There's only one head of the church. Once you are a Christian, you belong to one true church. You need to, you need to get in the habit of stop thinking about you as a white person. You're going to limit yourself. 
Stop thinking about yourself as a black person. You're going to limit yourself. Stop thinking about yourself as Hispanic. You're going to limit yourself. Start thinking of yourself. I am the child of the great king. I'm the child of the great king. I am not limited by my color. I am not limited by my language. I am not limited by my culture because I serve the great king. And forget about your denomination also. We made up that junk ourselves. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Methodist. I have news for you. Catholics won't make it to heaven. Baptists won't make it to heaven. Methodists won't make it to heaven. Anglicans won't make it to heaven. The only person going to make it to heaven is someone that is born again. You need to change your name to B.A. I'm a B.A. I'm born again. I mean, some of you are Baptists, but you're still going to hell. Some are Catholics, they're still going to hell. You better be born again. The Bible says unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. I thank God this church is not a black church. Amen. If you think it is, you're in the wrong place. Unfortunately, we're still crippled by racism and classism and, di and discrimination. And we have divided church of Jesus Christ. Allow me to tell you one more story. I had a, a good friend who is now in, at home with the Lord. Some of you knew him when he was at Village. Reverend Willie J. Smith. Labored here at Village Baptist Church. And uh, when he finished his seminary, I took him to our convention office in Oakland. I don't know if you Dickin Allen or Dickin Brooks. One of you went with me. I took him there to be ordained. And interestingly enough, I was ordained by the Southern Baptist first, so I had to get my ordination ratified by the American Baptist the same day. So they gave me a test first. After they saw that I passed, they said, okay, now we'll take your person that you recommended for ordination. And he came in. If you all knew Willie, Willie had a gift to talk. And immediately he got in there, he started talking. And, he's, and the uh, executive minister of the American Baptist Churches of the West, Dr. Uh, Rasmussen, he's gone home to be with the Lord too. After everything, he said, Emmanuel, uh, you have recommended a good candidate. Unfortunately, there's no black church open. So I looked, I said, he went to a white seminary, mm -hmm. Whoa now. got a white degree. Uh -huh. <laughs> you telling me he can only pastor a black church? No, no, no. Oh, 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 wait, wait, we didn't mean that. Uh -huh, yes, but you said it. It's unfortunate. The church of Jesus, Jesus Christ is so racially, I should, I should not say racially, but ethnically divided. How are we going to get along in heaven?
The church is the church of Jesus Christ. As we minister, we're getting ready to have the women's conference in February. Please don't just reach out to black people. If you're going to reach out to the community, you have to just reach out to people who are in need. Why? Because untold millions are still untold. Untold millions are still outside the fold. Who's going to tell them? Just people of their ethnicity? We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. The only way that we can prove that we are a true church is to reach out to everyone. Reach out to everyone. Amen? Amen. True meaning of that song, reach out and touch this is a black person, a white person, a Chinese. Touch somebody else and make this world a better place. But let me change it. Make this church a better church. Reach out and touch people. It's amazing there are a lot of churches in areas where there are I was listening to the, what was going on in Ferguson. Ferguson has at least 63% population is black. 63%. They got a grand jury together made up of nine whites and all they need to get a vote it's nine. And put three token blacks on the grand jury. I don't know if you're still following me. It's not politics. I'm just telling the truth. And let the devil be ashamed. You think that was not intentional? In a city, in a Community where 63%, at least 63% was black. There should have been more black on the grand jury than there are whites. But I can't, I, I can't expect heathens to do what a Christian would do. And that's why the same thing should not be happening in our churches. Amen. There are many churches that live in, that are built in areas where the majority of the people there are white. And the majority of the people in the congregation are black. That's not a right picture. The church should reflect the community. That's what you see when you get on your job. Amen. Sharing the gospel without racism, prejudice, and discrimination. This is just the introduction. We'll conclude next week. Let us pray.